Today, the, well, previously, a couple of weeks ago, the Munn Center for Entrepreneurship contacted me and asked if they could send someone over to give like a couple of minute presentation on what they're about and what they do. And I thought this was the perfect sort of lecture for that because it's super informal and just basically a tutorial lecture. And so take it away. Thank you very much. All right, I'll just get this on me. Okay, so good morning, everyone. My name is Herschel. I'm from the Center for Entrepreneurship. I was a student here at Munn, and now I work for the center. Um, so just raise your hands real quick. Has anyone here ever thought about becoming an entrepreneur or getting into entrepreneurship? Cool. Uh, what, what have you, uh, what's your idea? Uh, a method, a technology solution for uh, simplifying the calculation of carbon emission equivalent for uh, small to medium industries. Awesome, awesome. And so raise your hand. Oh, okay. Got, got you. Got you. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, and then raise your hands if you've ever, uh, you know, like heard of the Center for Entrepreneurships before. Okay, perfect. That's fantastic. So I'll go over some of the programs that we have to offer and just talk a little bit about, um, you know, what we're doing. It'll be brief, about five minutes. Um, but, you know, the Center for Entrepreneurship is, you know, Memorial's premier and flagship um, Center for Entrepreneurship. We handle everything from A to Z, uh, all the way from people who are just getting started in entrepreneurship or don't even have an idea, all the way to people who have functioning businesses that they want to actually scale. So um, some of the programs we offer to students of any faculty, so I'm assuming most of you guys are computer science, but um, to any faculty, these are all open. Uh, some of these programs are listed here. Uh, the first one is called Disruptive Thinkers Club. So this is a relatively new program, and it involves about a 90-minute per week uh, time commitment to where you um, are a student who just wants to build your entrepreneurial skills. So you don't have to have a business idea, but if you just want to build entrepreneurial skills um, or you know become more entrepreneurially minded, um, this is a fantastic program where uh, the team will meet for about an hour and a half every week and discuss like different entrepreneurial concepts, how to you know start a business, how to find a good problem to solve, uh, all of that sort of stuff. That's the Disruptive Thinkers Club. The second um, program I'm going to talk about, I'm going to jump over the Experience Ventures and Illuminate programs, uh, is called the Learn Launch Program. So this is sort of a step up from the Disruptive Thinkers Club. It that font is legible up on the okay. screen, so let me just. Oh, perfect. Awesome. So um, the second program here is called Learn Launch. So this is designed for people who've already done the Disruptive Thinkers Club. Uh, of course, all these programs are entry level, but typically if you're just starting out, you would do the Disruptive Thinkers Club first and then move on to the Learn Launch program. This is about three to four hours a week uh, for 12 weeks. And completing this gets you $1,000 to uh, use either for your own personal expenses or for your business's expenses. Um, typically, we ask for a student that has an idea for a startup. Um, and we take students in for 12 weeks, and it's three or four hours a week, um, where we're basically validating your startup idea and going through the initial steps of actually launching uh, a business. So it's designed to take something from literally from like just an idea, just a seed, uh, up to you know a potentially functioning and launching business. Beyond that, um, our flagship program uh, is called the Entrepreneurial Work Term slash Internship Program. Is anyone here in, in engineering? No, all cool. So. I know for engineering, there is, um, there's these work terms for engineering, which the EWT program actually satisfies. Um, you guys also have work terms as well? Okay, cool. So I wouldn't be surprised if these also satisfy the work term requirement for your faculty. I'll double, double, check, double check with your academic uh, staff just to be sure. Um, but even if they don't, we still have an internship option. So think of the entrepreneurial work term slash internship program as two separate programs that are effectively the same thing. So almost like two different streams. Um, there's one that comes through as a work term and then one that comes through as an internship. So again, this is our flagship program. It's an intensive program. Um, it's actually full time. So it's 35 plus. Typically, you'll work more like 45 to 60 hours a week um, for 12 to 14 weeks. So it's a full semester. Um, and very simply, it's people who have an idea or even typically a functioning business and actually want to develop that further. You can get paid typically $6,000 for that semester, but it can actually go up to about $9,000. Um, and again, it's an intensive program for students who want the opportunity to rapidly advance their startup. So typically what happens is you would start in the Disruptive Thinkers Club uh, and just you know build your entrepreneurial skills. 
then move on to the learn launch program where you actually go and validate a startup idea. Do you guys know what validate means? Yeah. Okay. So validate just to, uh, for information, validation in this case just means that you're making sure that your business idea is something that people actually want in the very simple terms. So you're, you're, you know, you go to learn launch, you're validating your business idea, and then you would go and start doing an entrepreneurial work term or internship where you're just paid, um, for full-time work on your startup. Uh, of course, throughout both learn launch and the entrepreneurial work term slash internship program, you get regular meetings with our uh, entrepreneurship coaches and uh, what we call EIR, so entrepreneurs in, red in residence. Um, beyond that, we have two uh, auxiliary programs. The first is called Experience Ventures, and this is effectively uh, mini placements with existing startups here like in MUN. And you can join this as a startup, so you can look for up to five students to work for you um, and then have them get paid by the Experience Ventures program, so it's like a free labor type of thing. Um, or you can come in as a student looking for some experience and to get paid uh, for a 40 or 80 hour work placement. Um, if you know what a MUSEP is, this is very similar. It doesn't take away from your MUSEP, um, but it's very similar to the, um, to the setup of a MUSEP. So 40 or 80 hours um, per placement, uh, and then if you're a startup, you can come in and get up to five students doing 40 to 80 hours for you uh, of work. And then lastly, we do have this thing called Illuminate. This is brand new. Uh, it's an entrepreneurial skills training and pitch competition. It's open to any uh, female identifying or gender, gender diverse student. Um, and it involves seven one hour skill development sessions. Um, and then the remaining time commitment, commitment is dependent on each student. Um, beyond that, we do have a mentorship program. This doesn't really apply to most people. I will talk about it, you know, briefly. Um, after you do a work term internship or two of them, um, you know, you are eligible for what's called the mentorship program. This is long-term support uh, for student startups, and there is no direct payment for it. Um, but, you know, you may be eligible for some exclusive funding opportunities um, that we would sort of boutique out to you. And then, um, again, this is for people who have a fully validated business idea and who have, you know, preferably completed at least one of the above programs, typically the internship. Um, additional to that, up here in the top, oh, well, I should go down here. Uh, you can also, at any time, book a meeting with a startup. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely not. No, we're a nonprofit, so we don't take any cut of the business whatsoever in any of these programs. Um, and of course, at any time, you can actually book a meeting with one of our startup coaches to help you find the right program. Or if you just want, you know, advice on a business idea, um, you're more than welcome to book a meeting with one of our startup coaches. Um, we have Jan, Mandy, uh, we got El Emily and Rachel, as well as uh, Emily Evans and Lauren Sanders. Uh, and our, you know, our, the areas of expertise are quite large. So Jan's a big tech sector guy. Mandy is as well. She's a fantastic um, healthcare, uh, health tech sector uh, entrepreneur. And then we have people in social enterprises, uh, local business and tech, retail, fashion and, bra and brand building. Um, and then we have our director as well, who's actually, um, funny enough, our director is the guy who built uh, Zorbit's Math Adventures. Um, have you guys heard of that before? You have? Yeah. So that's the guy who like did that. Um, so you know, we have a very, very high variety of uh, entrepreneurs here and a really high variety of programs here. Um, and, you know, again, if you're just looking to get started, I would definitely recommend the Disruptive Thinkers Club. If you already have a business idea and you want to validate it, you could look at, you know, jumping into the Learn Launch program. I will say that if you are looking to do Learn Launch, the deadline for that is tomorrow. So, you know, do get your, your uh, application in as soon as possible. Um, and then if you do have, you know, a business and you would like to sort of go full time in it, typically you would do this without ha doing any other courses or doing maybe just one course. Uh, so this is a big thing in the summer, um, but you can, you know, always apply every semester. These are offered for the, uh, the work term program slash internship. So that's pretty much all it is, uh, all there is for me. If you want any more information or want to go deeper on this stuff, our, uh, you know, our website's just mun.ca slash MCE, uh, or you can just search up MCE Mun on Google. So yeah, thank you for your time. Any uh, questions? Yep. For the learn launch, uh, my idea, or if I'm working in a partnership, the application is just a single person applying, but is that yep. still open to the partnership or is it just for one person? Uh, so the... You wouldn't, you wouldn't be paid um, $1,000 per person. It would be $1,000. Um, it would typically be one person in the program. Um, 
so, and that person has to be a month student as well. Um, if your co-founder isn't a month student, that's okay. Um, as long as you're applying um, as a month student, like yourself. Okay. This is the application actually right here. So it's it's on a per person. Like we would require your student number yeah, and stuff I'm there. Yeah, I was wondering if, uh, like, if I do this application, yeah. my name, everything like that, can my partner also attend? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we encourage that actually. Um, we encourage not just for Learn Launch, but for Disruptive Thinkers Club, for the entrepreneurial work term, as long as they understand that like that wouldn't increase the bursary amount g given to you at the end of the semester. Um, we we encourage uh, founders to sort of attend these meetings together and you know learn together. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I think I had another question in the back. Yep. So the the thing that's like a MUSA. Uh, yeah, can 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 you repeat your question? Okay. Sorry. So it's you. Okay. So the question is, if someone's doing eighty hours, um, can they still do the Experience Ventures program? So if someone's doing a, a MUSEP at eighty hours, can they still do the, do the Experience Ventures program? That's a yes. Yeah, yeah. The Experience Ventures program is actually run out of uh, Alberta. I think it's University of Calgary that does it. Um, but we're like Mon is a part of the program, part of the corpus of universities that's involved, um, and so it's ex external to a MUSEP. Cool. Yeah, we yeah we were aware of the uh, the so the the thing was there's a you know if you're an international student there there I guess there was a a limit I think of 20 hours a week for um, for work so we were aware of that but that I think that has been lifted temporarily so yeah so um, but yeah if, in the future yes if you if you are um, doing one of these programs if you're an international student we would just um, like doing the 80 hours, we would just make sure that we, you get no more than 20 hours uh, per week. So, cool. Any other questions there for me? From personal experience, from being a student for so long, if you are doing five courses, you probably don't want to work more than 20 hours. Yeah, if, yeah. We we definitely don't recommend like doing a whole lot of uh, you know a whole lot of hours per week of school and then on top doing all, all this on top of it. Um, especially for the entrepreneurial work term program, like it's 35 plus hours, but you're going to be working closer to 60. Um, especially if you want the full, like, like the full, like 9,000 that we would, you know, give out to a student who's really putting in like full-time hours. Um, typically people would do this either as a work term student, um, or, uh, they would just do this in, you know, at the time, at the time of their, I guess, academic year when they're not taking very many courses or any courses at all. Um, but you know, that's, I guess why we, like we have the disruptive thinkers club, which is only 90 minutes a week. It's unpaid, but it's still super valuable. And even if you never want to become an entrepreneur, it's still a really good thing to have on your resume to say that you've developed some uh, entrepreneurial thinking skills. Um, cause that's, you know, that's valued everywhere, not just, uh, in entrepreneurship. All right. Any more questions? Yep. Yeah, so for the Learn Launch program, the, let's see, typically, well, you would apply first using this application. Um, they would give, they would get back to you and probably have either a virtual meeting or an in-person meeting um, and potentially just, you know, a couple of emails back and forth. It's not a really long interview process. Um, what you would need to upload is just a resume, a transcript, and then a high-level business, high-level description of the problem you're trying to solve. So, like, what is it that you're trying to do on a very high level is almost like an oxymoron. It's like, it's actually a very basic level uh, description of what you're trying to do. Um, and then you would need to submit a video. This is probably the closest thing to like, you know, an actual interview um, that you would want to have, but it's a one to two minute video um, just explaining who you are, what you're doing and why, and, and why you want to be in the program. Um, typically after that, they would just uh, contact you and either and just let you know if you if they want to meet and um, and speak to you. Um, in my experience, they're always going to say you should meet, but um, 
yeah, they're, they're always going to be um, open to having new students in there. They might just like, if they say no to learn launch, they'll find a, another program for you. That's really good. Typically it's the disruptive thinkers club yeah, or experience ventures. Cool. Any other questions? All good. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much again, MCE Mun. If you have any other questions, or concerns, uh, and we're located in, in EN 3075. So that's engineering 3075. Um, don't be afraid to come on in and hang out. Thank you. What was your name again? Do you want to say? My name is uh, Herschel. Awesome. Perfect. All right. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions about the assignment setup while I get started? Yep. So uh, I was assigned to a web, so I might answer the question, but in Mac, we're not going to use Visual Studio. Visual Studio, okay. not VS Code. Okay. Visual Studio for Mac, A, is being discontinued soon. Okay. Thank, thank the Lord that that's <laughs> happening. B, it is actually not Visual Studio. It's another product from another company that Microsoft bought and labeled as that. It has nothing to do with Visual Studio for Windows. So do not use that. Do you have a recommendation for what to use the MacBook? Just open the text file in VS Code, install any C++ plugins that you want for VS Code, and just edit the text file, and then you can hit Terminal. So let me, let me just show you, actually, so this is a good idea. Um, Just, just give me a second, and I'll talk about that. I'm almost set up here. All right. So this is another assignment, uh, or another course. So just give me a second. Don't save that. So I'm going to open up VS Code here. This is just literally default VS Code, no extensions, because I just installed it on this laptop. Then um, I've got it zoomed in a bit. But if I zoom out, I get this file menu. And then you can go Open Folder. And if you click Open Folder, then you go to, I think I have this saved on the desktop. 4300, A1. Now I'm going to open. I, I don't need access to any of these other files. I could open this folder if I wanted to. And Visual, uh, VS Code calls this like a project. But it's just a folder. Okay? And so over here, I can see all the things now in this project. So I can click Make File. There's the Make File. I can come over here in Source, and I can see main.cpp. Okay? So 
Down here you'll see, do you want to install the recommended C++ extension pack? Whatever. If you do, that's actually pretty great because you can like set it up. The, the mic is on, by the way, right? Yeah. Okay. So you can set it up so that you can hit like a button to compile and run your program. But it does that through the command line in, in the back, right? So VS Code, it's a good editor to use because it is exactly the same on all operating systems, right? So what I would do if I was just starting out is open up main.cpp. I am not going to install those extensions right now. But up here, there's a terminal, and you can hit new terminal. And so that opens up a terminal in the folder that you have open. So down here, if I was on Mac or Linux, I could just type make. Right? So I go up here, do, 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 edit my code, go down, type make, or make run, and then it will make and run the program. So this is the workflow that I would recommend. Um, so I'm not necessarily recommending that this is better than Xcode, but it is certainly easier to set up than Xcode. And I, since I'm not familiar with that, that's the one thing I cannot offer help with is the setup of, setup of Xcode. So um, yeah, just open your assignment folder as a folder in VS Code, and then you have it all as it should be. Um, you can set up, you can set it up to use GDB for a visual debugger if you want. Um, you can have autocomplete with the C++ extensions. You can have it hit a button to make and run the program. There's all sorts of things you can do with VS Code, um, but they're just a YouTube video away. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you how to to edit your code and run it. So Visual Studio comes with a project file where everything is defined for you already. Um, second, it is a huge pain to set up Make and, on Windows because you have to install Clang to, and then that compiler then change the Make file and then it's in all different sorts of locations. Visual Studio has a compiler built in. So that's the MSVC compiler, Microsoft Visual Studio compiler. And so Visual Studio offers you a one-click solution to just running the entire project. And it also has a debugger built in and a bunch of, a bunch of nice features for like profiling. We'll talk about profiling in the future as well. So convenience, convenience and features. Oh. Yeah. In fact, I would argue that setting up Visual Studio is less convenient, but setting up the other compiler and stuff in Windows is, is, is a pain. So. If you're in Windows, do yourself a favor, just use Visual Studio, it's, it's way easier. So that's what I would recommend on the Mac. Okay, so I said that uh, this lecture, so I, I inserted this lecture as a, as a sort of bonus lecture this year. So if you look at the schedule, this is lecture 4A <laughs> instead of lecture 5. Um, in the next lecture, we're going to be getting into ECS and, and what all that is, how to implement it. But essentially what I saw was that when I, I've been teaching this course for three years online, and the great thing about online courses is that you can run a few minutes long, right? So when I did the last lecture of the setup and um, the assignment one, I also went into a bit of tutorial like this, and then the lecture ended up being like an hour and 50 minutes or something like that. So now I just split it into two, and that's why I said, hey, come in, take a bunch of time and talk about the NCE because it's not um, going to affect this lecture too much. So what I did want to do was just go over um, some of the more important parts of the SFML tutorial. And again, it's really unfortunate timing that SFML came out with a new version so close to the start of this course. So I'm going to be using 2.5 for this version of the course. Uh, I have not gone to look yet if 2.6 is just pluggable into this course or not, or if it works with this version of I am GUI. I, I haven't looked at any of that stuff yet, but we know it works with 2.5. And 2.6 should not be a huge departure from 2.5, so I still feel comfortable using the 2.5 tutorial. I don't think that the syntax has changed too much. So. If you go to the link that I have in the setup, you'll be taken to this um, tutorial for SFML. 
And you can see here it says, warning, this page refers to an old version of SFML. That wasn't true as of like a month ago, but they just came out with a new version. But it's, like I said, it should be all the same. So here at the start, they have um, tutorials for like getting SFML set up with Visual Studio. And so it's going to tell you, hey, download it, put the um, inclusion, uh, additional include directories, the additional library directories. So when, you set, when I give you that um, solution file for Visual Studio, all that stuff is already done for you. It just points to that environment variable that we set up. And so I've done all of the setup of Visual Studio for you and then just given you the solution file. So you don't need to go through these tutorials um, that I've given or uh, that they give because I've already given those. And it says here there's a, there's a tutorial for Xcode. Has anyone tried that? Okay, try it if you want. Um, you can let me know if it worked. Uh, but down here is where we start to get into um, the different, I guess this is sort of the API um, tutorial for SFML. We are not going to be doing much with handling time uh, using threads or user data streams in this particular class. So um, a student once asked me, why aren't we adding networking to our game engine? And the answer to that is that that would be an entire other course. Um, networking is not as simple as just setting up a client and a server and passing data. When it comes to video games, you, okay, how do you end up syncing the, you know, the two clients? How do I deal with lag? Okay, what about computer lag versus network lag? It's, it's a real doozy, okay? And so I'm, I'm gonna say that we're not touching networking in this course, but it, it exists and you can do all sorts of different things um, with networking. However, we will first go into um, the window module. So there's a bunch of different stuff about the window. Um, and if you've ever programmed, has anyone ever written a program in sort of like raw OpenGL before? Okay, so OpenGL is an older technology now. Uh, it's been deprecated on a couple of, you know, in a couple of different places. Um, so, you know, people are using modern Windows applications typically use either Vulkan or DirectX rather than OpenGL. But OpenGL was just like one of the first open source graphics programming libraries that allowed you to use a GPU instead of the CPU for your calculations. SFML uses OpenGL under the hood um, because it's open source. There are open source um, versions of it and it uses that to do all of its drawing. So it's very fast. Everything it does uses the GPU, but it has just abstracted away all of that really annoying um, window setup, texture setup, all that stuff that takes dozens of lines to do in OpenGL, where you literally tell the GPU, this is texture number one, upload this data, then when I go to draw a texture, I switch to that texture and then draw it. Like all that stuff is just done for you by SFML. So um, I realize that this is a bit small, but when I zoom in, it like doesn't really make it much bigger. Um, so let me just try this. So Windows and SFML, defined by the SF window class. So we saw this already where we set up a window and then we give it a video mode and then we give it a title. This is the simplest possible way to set up a window and then we can use all the functionality um, on that. This is an SF window. In our assignment, we use a, a render window. That's just a derived class of window. And so this tutorial shows you um, all the different settings for that. So you can set in styles for that window if you want to. So you could have a, a none style. So that means it has no decoration. So there would be no title bar, no little border around the window, etc. cetera. Uh, you could give it a title bar style. That is the default style for a windowed mode. Um, you can say, okay, I want this to be resizable or not. And it turns out that when you resize the window, um, it doesn't resize like the world that you live in inside SFML, it just stretches by default, okay? So if we want to have our window be resizable and not affect the aspect ratio or the size of things, there would be more things that we would have to do to enable that. But just keep in mind that if you enable resizing, it may not have the behavior that you are um, actually thinking it should have. Uh, whether or not it has a close button, whether or not it is in full screen mode. And so full screen will take a resolution and then enter like an actual full screen mode. So most games 
that you've run, or most applications, have one of three modes that they typically run in. One is a windowed mode, where it actually has a window that you can move around on your desktop. The second one is full screen, but in a windowed mode. So what that does is it just takes a window, and it makes it as big as your screen. And then the third thing is an actual full screen mode. And the benefit of a full screen mode is that you have um, all of the, when a full screen application is running, all the rendering of the rest of the operating system is basically turned off. Okay? So if you have an application or a game and you tell it to run in full screen mode, typically you're going to expect better performance out of that application because all the rendering, like if you've got Chrome and stuff open in the background, that's just not happening anymore. The operating system deals with that. The annoying thing is um, if the resolution that the full screen mode is running in is not the same as your desktop, well, when you ta alt tab back and forth, you may have seen this before, a full screen application takes longer to alt tab back and forth into. So, you know, if you're playing like some game like, I don't know, Path of Exile, where you might have to have a wiki open to have some information, then like tabbing back and forth between the game, if it's in full screen mode, is going to take longer and be slightly more annoying. And so it's that trade-off, again, there's always trade-offs between a full screen game running faster. Now, it may not be a dramatic amount, and it, in fact, today's games are pretty optimized for windowed mode as well. So full screen will run a bit faster, but it's a little bit more annoying to use, especially if you have multiple monitors. It may actually turn off your other monitors, depending on the operating system, et cetera. And then the default mode um, gives you uh, title bar, resize, close. If you ever see this, these bars, this is essentially, and I, okay, so let me, why not? Let me just explain this. So, okay, uh, let me, for, I know you can't see this, I'm going to make it bigger. So, can I just do this? Perfect. All right. So let's say we have some integers, and we look at the binary representation of those integers in memory. Okay? So what's happening here is that let's say we have some options that we want to store in a video game. Um, so you may have all those options that we just looked at. So for example, is it resizable? Is it tile mode? Is it whatever? So maybe you have a bunch of those different options. Rather than say, OK, I'm going to have a string for each of those options, and then I'll store a vector of strings so I know what the options are, many, many years ago, um, someone much smarter than I realized that you can do this with something called a bit set. And so what a bit set is, is you use an integer, which is a collection of bits. right? So typically, I've drawn eight bits here. So this would be a char. But a normal integer would either be 32 or 64 bits. I just didn't want to type that much. And basically, what you do is you assign, this might be um, resizable, resize mode. This might be title bar. This might be close button. So you assign each bit to an option like this, right? And so you're going to say, OK, that's a resize option. Uh, one zero, which is two, that's the title bar option. And one oh oh, that's the close button option. And now what I want to do is I'm going to store a collection of all of my options. And so you might say, OK, well, now I'm going to need a vector of integers or something like that. Nope, you'll have a bit set. So what a bit set is, an empty bit set just has a bunch of zeros in it. And this bit set would mean that that bit is set, so that is 1. Another bit is set, so that is 1. And what we can do, if we use the XOR, or, or sorry, not XOR, if we use the OR operator on two integers, so let's say we took resize and ORed it with 0. OR just means if it was a 1 in the other one, or a 0 in the other one. Well, if it was anything and we OR it with a 1, it's going to be a 1, right? So if we OR this with resize, then this will mean, OK, this bit set represents a set of options that just contains resizable. If 
we want to add the title bar to that, we take that and we or it with title bar, and what we get is this. Resize or title bar. Okay? So in one integer, in one bit set, we can store all of our options. And you can store as many things as you want up to the size of the data structure that you're using, right? So the downside, the upside of this is that it's extremely fast and extremely memory efficient. The downsides are that it's kind of hard to remember all of these integers. And so your library will have to have like definitions of, hey, option title bar is equal to 00001, option resize is 0002, or whatever. And the other annoying thing is um, they're a little bit more difficult to work with because how do we read an individual bit and like how do we set an individual bit? I'm not going to get into that right now, but that's what I want to show you because you will see that in different technologies and different places, especially when you're working in C and C++, is this is called a bit set. It is typically used as a set of bits to store options like this. So when they say that default is equal to title bar or resize or close, then when you pass options into a window, you can or together all of the options that you want and pass it as a single value into the option. So that's how you set different options. And that's not immediately obvious what's going on there. It took me a, a while to realize that as well, but yeah, it's just a bit set. So, um, you can also do this in two different lines. So instead of just passing this into the constructor of SFML, you can, uh, let me just stay over here, you can create a window somewhere in your code, and then later you can create that window. Once our, um, our game engine gets a little bit more complicated, and I believe actually in assignment two, um, when we're separating things into different classes, we will be creating the window in one place, and we'll be, or sorry, we'll be creating the variable in one place and then creating the actual window in another place. Second, what we have to do is actually do something with that window. So here again, we just have our main program. And the reason I'm, I'm doing this here instead of live coding it is because our assignment one also has IM GUI in there. And there's some extra code in IM GUI that just I, I want to ignore for now and just show you SFML. And so this is SFML. So we create a window, and if all we do is create a window and then return zero, the program runs for a millisecond and then stops. Nothing happens. So what we actually have to do is keep the program alive somehow and keep it rendering new things all the time. So we say while window dot is open, and so the window is open, we are going to, in here, put all of the content of our game. Right? Now, we'll do this in a way that you know, we're not going to have a thousand line of code inside this while loop, but we're going to have classes and functions that we have in here that do the things for us. So um, this is how we handle events in SFML, and you've seen this in the code in your assignment. So what we do, uh, SFML uses an event polling system. So if you think about it, there's two main ways that you could handle keyboard and mouse events in a computer program. One would be on every frame of the game, you poll the operating system, or you, you ask the operating system, um, is the A key currently held? Is the B key currently held? Is the left mouse button currently held? Is uh, the, the mouse in a different position than it was? That gets really cumbersome. And there's no right or, of the two things that I'm going to mention, there's no right or wrong way, there's just trade-offs again. So individually asking whether or not the, the key is being held is, is kind of annoying. And if you think about it, if you want to have something happen when a click actually happens, so when it goes from not being held to being held, not only do you have to ask, hey, is it being held, but you have to store the fact that it wasn't being held on the last frame. Okay, so that can get a little bit annoying. So what this system does is that it's an event-based system where SFML 
does the handling of events for you. So for every possible event that could have happened, we're going to have this event object. And then whenever you call event, the window stores all the events that happened on that frame. So let's say I press the A button, or I press the A key, I press the B key, and I left clicked the mouse. Then the window knows that those three events have happened on that frame of the window. And so whenever I call event, that gives me the next event that happened. So the very first time I call it, it might say, hey, the A key was pressed. And what it does is it puts that data into this event object. So now this event object, after the first time I call poll event, it's going to return true if there was an event, because not every frame, actually the vast majority of frames are going to have no events, right? You're not pressing stuff most of the time. And so that's going to store inside event the type of the event, if it was a keyboard event, which key was pressed, if it was a mouse event, which mouse button was pressed, etc. So if you do enter this while loop, it means that an event has happened. And then you can use event.type to get the type of event that happened. So event.type equals SF event closed. That is something that happens when you click the X on the window. So when you click the X on the window, what do we want to happen? Well, you might say, well, just close the window. That's pretty obvious. But you may want other things to happen, right? Maybe you want to save the user's game when that button is pressed. You don't want it just to quit out, right? Maybe I have some memory allocated somewhere that I need to free up. Or I have some other file of data that I need to clean up or whatever. So if you want something to happen when the window is closed, then this is what you would do for that. Yep? Yes. And so that's what I was just about to say. Let's say that this was like the A button being pressed. So we have no code here to handle the A button being pressed. And so this is a while loop. And so it will call that function again. And if there was another function being, uh, there was another event, then now we're handling that event. And it gets the next one, gets the next one, gets the next one, until it doesn't have a next one, returns false, and this while loop exits. Yeah. So instead of it being, a vector of events that we loop through, somewhere the vector of events is stored, and we're just asking for the next one. So yeah. If, if uh, let's say two events happen at the same time, and you press the A key and you click the mouse, right? Yep. They process it the first event type one of the events and then the other. Yep. So isn't there some sort of like uh, issue with waiting for time between the two events according to the No. Because what is happening is, and we'll get into this, so I have an entire lecture on, on game loops and stuff. But essentially what's happening inside your while loop, which is the main game loop, we call it, typically what you're going to do is you're going to process all of your events. Then you're going to update your game state, so do all the physics, and then render the entire window. So all of the update of your game state has happened before you do any of the drawing. So as long as you don't have a weird game where like, so if two things happen at the, on the same frame, you as a game programmer need to figure out, does that matter? Like, does, it, does me processing one, one action before the other matter? And sometimes it does, right? Like if units are going to be colliding and this one moves before this one, Maybe, maybe that causes some weird error, but that's something we have to handle as game programmers. And we'll, we'll get into to that as we progress more through the course. Yeah. So the first thing that we do typically on each frame is handle the events. Yeah. Oh, just for clarification, so all those events happening, that, it, that would exist within a frame? So a frame cannot move on until all those events have completed? So you have a window open. Yeah. If that window is your... Um, foreground window, right? It has focus on window. So it's not the background window, it's the one you're currently active in. Um, what's going to happen is, and there's kind of no good way to, to demonstrate this, but the very first time it draws, that will be the first iteration of this while loop, right? So 
you process events that happened on that first frame. And I'm calling it a frame because like, I'm just saying one frame is one drawing of the window, right? So the very first iteration of this loop, it processes the events. Then you may do other stuff. Then you're going to call your render on the window. So window.draw, sorry, window.clear, window.draw, then window.display. What window.display does under the hood, so OK, let's just get into the weeds. <laughs> um, typically, especially nowadays, every window that's being drawn, especially like OpenGL, DirectX, it's called double buffered. So what a buffer is, is just a, an array of data, essentially. So a buffer is where you are writing data that something will happen to later. And so you may ask yourself, how am I actually drawing to the screen and then, but I'm not seeing like, you know, the circle being drawn first and then the rectangle being drawn next and then the other thing being drawn. Well, first of all, because it's operating at like gigahertz, right? But the second thing is because there are two screen buffers for that window. One is the one being displayed. The other one is the one that you're drawing to. So if you think about it, you've got one painting, like one, well, what do you paint on? What's that called? Canvas. canvas. You got one canvas over here and another canvas over here. And let's say I'm really fast at drawing and I'm trying to show you an animation, right? So I draw the first one and maybe the first one is blank. So I, I show you the first one, it's blank. In the background, I'm drawing the next one. Then I take them and I swap them. And now you're looking at the one I just drew. While you're looking at the one I just drew, I'm drawing the next one. And now I swap them. And that's literally what's happening. It's hidden from you. In, in, if you were to write OpenGL, you would literally call GL swap buffers. But in here, you call window.display. And it does a bunch of things, including that in the background. So whenever you are drawing, you are drawing to a hidden thing that is not being shown. And then when you call window.display, one of the things that happens is says the rendering buffer now becomes the display buffer. And the display bus buffer becomes the rendering buffer. So there are just two buffers that keep getting swapped back and forth. Then there you get into like triple buffering and all this weird stuff if the pipeline is longer. But we're not, we're not touching any of that in this course. Yeah. So now you can see we're using SFML because the whole course would be this stuff if we, if we ended up using raw OpenGL. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll get to, to some of those details as well, but just realize that that's what's happening. And of course, you can get away with not knowing what's happening, right? Like, I, you can drive a car without knowing how the engine works. But if you do know how the engine works, there are certain things you probably won't do to your car, like rev up the RPMs. Hey, why is my car louder when I push the gas pedal down? That's probably something you want to know, right? And so these details make you a better programmer, even though you don't need to know about them. OK. Um, so let's actually do something. You can, you can set a whole bunch of stuff on the window. Uh, you can set the position of the window. So that's relative to the desktop. So for example, if you always want your game to launch in the middle of the screen, you can do that if you want to. Um, you can set the size of the window after it has been created. So you could like resize the window if something happens. You probably don't want to do that to your user, but it is something that's possible. You can set the title. Uh, similarly, you can uh, get the size, etc. You can also say, um, you can poll whether or not, hey, does this window have focus? And focus doesn't mean like focus like your eyes, but in Windows, like right now, Firefox has focus because it's the topmost window. Right now, Notepad has focus, right? So focus means this is the window that is receiving inputs from the user. Um, so what does that mean? Well, if you've ever played a game, uh, they probably have a, well, some games have like a background FPS, so that if you're like tabbed out of the game, it's not using as much CPU or GPU. So you could say, hey, if the window doesn't have focus, the user's currently not focused on it, they're not sending inputs, there might be something I want to do if that's happening. Maybe turn off the music or lower the volume or whatever. So that'll tell you if the window has focus or not. And, and that line of code is about eight or nine lines of code 
in each various operating system of like asking the specific operating system, hey, loop through the windows, tell me if this is the one that has focus, et cetera. I've done it, it's, it's a nightmare. Um, this is window handle stuff. You can get the raw Windows handle, which Windows uses to do weird things if you want to like do crazy stuff. We're not going to get into that in this course. Um, you can turn on vSync, and you can turn on a frame limit if you want. Uh, a vertical sync, uh, how much of this am I going to talk about? Um, vertical sync essentially ensures that the frame rate is going to match your monitor's refresh rate. You can get into situations without vSync where your game is running faster than your monitor can display, and that can result in weird sorts of things. So if you've ever played like, you know, CSGO or something, and it's running at like 400 FPS, but your monitor is only 60 FPS, well, they have a system for doing that, and then there's tick rates versus refresh rates and versus frames per second, and we'll get into that stuff as we go. But you can set it on the window if you want. All right, so that's all the window stuff that you need to know. Um, now, events. Events are important. We are going to be doing more complicated stuff with events later. But here is an example that I just showed, uh, a similar example to what I just showed you. So you can say if event.type equals, or you can use a switch statement because events are actually integers under the hood. So if we say switch event.type, that's just a, a little bit more convenient way of writing a bunch of if statements. So this case is if the event is closed, okay, if the event is window closed, then we'll shut down the program properly. Otherwise, if we have a key pressed event, so if we pressed two keys on the same frame, uh, we would get one event, and then later we'd get the next event. Um, okay, they say we don't process other types of event. There are other types of events, like mouse events. You can get like a mouse button clicked, uh, a mouse move event, all sorts of different types of events. But in this, they're just, I think they're just showing keys. This goes into details about the closed event, um, if there's a closed button. There's also a resized event. So if you have a game and you want them to allow the resizing of the window, which is convenient sometimes, um, then an event is fired, and you may have to like redraw the window in a different aspect ratio or something based on the event. Um, Lost focus and gain focus, so if we tab in or tab out, we can do some things. We're not going to um, do that. Text entered, we won't be looking at that. You can imagine what that one is. I am GUI is handling text entry stuff for us. Key pressed and key release events. So this is important because the pushing down of a key and the releasing of a key are two separate events. And in our assignment, when we go on later, so for example, assignment three, where we're running Mario around, what we want to do is when we push the key down, we're going to set a velocity for our, uh, for our entity. And then when we release the key, we are going to take away that velocity from the entity. That's one way of doing it. If we were doing it the other way, then on every frame, we would say, hey, if the right button is being held, then Mario has this speed. But what we're doing here is, is a different way of saying when the state of the key goes from not pressed to pressed, that is a key pressed event. When that event happens, apply the speed. Now, when an, a released event happens, take away the speed. There are two different ways of doing it. Right? One is polling each frame to see whether the button is pressed. The other is an event-based system. So if you've played games, especially older games on a computer, like for example, I know that this happens in EverQuest, um, an old MMO that I've played. If I am running in a circle, so I'm pressing the up arrow and the left arrow. So I'm just running in a circle, right? Because it's like World of Warcraft. It's a first-person type of game. So I'm running in a circle, running in a circle, running in a circle. If I Alt-Tab while I'm doing that, what has happened? Well, while the window had focus, it detected two events, to start running forward and to start running left. Then I tab out. When I'm tabbed out, it's no longer reading events. That's when I release the keys. It didn't see the key release. So then I tab back into the game, and I'm still running in a circle. 
Now, how do I stop running in a circle? Well, the game only stops running in a circle after it detects the key release event. Right? It's not polling, is it held, is it held, is it held. So I'd have to push both buttons and then release them again in order for it to stop. So if you're ever playing a game and you've got an input being held and you tab out and you come back and that input is still happening, that's why. And you can tell that that game is using an event-based system rather than a constant polling-based system because of that behavior that you've observed. Okay? And a cool thing as well is that in some games, if you're mouse looking, right, it's, or if you've got a button held down with the mouse and then you detect, um, like let's say I'm, I'm looking in a game, like I'm mouse looking around, like in any first person shooter. This happens in, in EverQuest as well, but other games. So I have to like right click, oh come on, okay. So I have to right click and then pan my mouse and it starts turning. And then if I alt tab while I'm doing that and I come back into the game, it's still turning. Because the last thing it saw was the mouse button pressed and it didn't get the mouse release event. So that's interesting. Uh, mouse wheel move, mouse wheel scrolled. Um, so you can do mouse wheel stuff, release event. Mouse moved event, this is another one. So um, mouse moved means that if it detects that the XY position of the mouse within the window is different than it was on the last frame, then that's an event. So we, want, we can do something with that. So in some cases, let's say, for example, we have a game like Assignment 2, where we're going to be clicking to shoot. We don't really care about when the mouse moves. All we care about is where the mouse is when the button is clicked. So for Assignment 2, we won't be using mouse moved event. We'll just be using the click event. And then when we click, we can pull where the mouse is. But if we, for example, had a game where when I'm moving the mouse around, let's say there's like a dog chasing the mouse cursor, then every time the mouse moves, we want to have an event. And so we can use the mouse, um, mouse moved event for that. And we will be using mouse moved um, later on. Uh, joystick buttons, we're not going to be dealing with that. Okay. So that's an, enough of the events. We've got 20 minutes left. Uh, we won't be talking about this thing, okay, drawing 2D stuff. I will briefly talk about this. So the drawing window. Um, so here, as I said before, uh, every frame, so between the swap, when I say a frame, a frame is everything that happens between the swapping, right, of the two paintings. You know, I should probably have that in a lecture because I think that's important and I never really explained that in previous offerings in class, so I'll do that. Uh, okay, so we first clear it. Or we, we do something to it. We could draw a rectangle that's all black if you want to. Or you could not clear it. But typically, we clear it, then we draw our stuff, and then we dot display. So that ends the current frame. And if you have a frame per second limit, so let's say, for example, I am doing 10 frames per second. That is my frame limit. So that means there has to be a minimum of 100 milliseconds between each frame being drawn. So what will happen here is window.display will draw the frame, and then it'll swap it. And then however long this took, so let's say this took a millisecond to do all of our calculations. Well, we had to wait a total of 100. So inside window.display, it knows the last time it displayed. It knows the current time. And so it will wait 99 milliseconds before going into the next iteration of that loop. Okay, so that's what window.display does, is it does that timing for you as well. All right. Um, off screen drawing. What is this? Okay, so what this means is that you don't always need to draw to a window. We can draw to a texture and then draw the texture to a window. Now you're saying that's just drawing to a window with extra steps. Why would I want to do that, right? A good example is uh, who, who did 3200? OK, so a few people did 3200. If you ever have a big grid, like our assignments in 3200, or you have a checkerboard, for example, what you can do is at the start of the game, you can draw that whole grid, which might be thousands and thousands of rectangles, to a texture, save it. And then if you want to display it to the screen, you just have to draw that texture once, and it's much faster. 
Okay, so some things you may want to render to a texture and then just draw the texture if, if it's very complicated. But if it's, if it's a dynamic thing, like the moving of an object, you wouldn't want to render that to a texture first. But if it's like a big grid, like in 3200, or you know, you've, you're, I don't know, maybe you've got like a 2D version of civilization or something and you want to draw the whole world or the map, you would render that to a texture and then just draw the texture. Um, we're not going to touch threads because threads is just as bad as networking. Um, everything is single threaded um, for us. We talked about um, fonts last time. Oh, let's talk about sprites and textures. Um, what is a sprite in SFML? So a sprite in SFML is two things. One, it is a optionally a texture. You don't have to have a texture for a sprite, but if you don't have a texture, nothing will actually be drawn. So a texture is a sprite and a shape. Ignore the word entity here because it means something different than the ECS entity. So if we have a texture, let's say we load a big old texture um, into our program uh, from a file. And then we say, by default, if we say sprite s, and then we give it that texture, whenever we draw the sprite, it will draw the entire texture. What a sprite gives us the option to do is specify a portion of that texture to be drawn. And you might say, well, why are you loading a big texture if you only want to draw a part of it? Well, we'll get to that when we talk about animations. So our animations that we'll be using in the course, we're going to have one texture that contains all the frames of animation. We load that once. And then when we go to draw the sprite, we're going to tell it which frame to draw, which part of the animation to draw. And so that saves on the number of files, the swapping in the, oh, in the GPU, and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. So a texture is an image yeah. that has been loaded into memory in our program. So a texture, OK, it's, it's essentially a 2D array of bytes, right? Um, so at each of the, of the elements of the 2D array, there's color information, essentially. And so a texture is a 2D array of color information, which is essentially an image. So we can load that from a file by saying SF texture and giving it a file name. SFML will handle the loading of that. Then we can construct a sprite from that texture by doing this. So we have a texture, texture.load from file. If it doesn't load, like if the file doesn't exist, it'll return false. So we can error handle with that. Um, this texture, this is how we say, I only want to draw this part of this texture. Um, we can create a blank texture in memory if we want to. We can modify the pixels of a texture by hand if we want to, or by hand, but manually in our program. Um, how we end up resizing textures is important. So whether or not they resize smoothly like this or jaggedly like this. We'll talk about that when we get back to textures. Um, if we have a sprite that is bigger than the texture, we can handle how the texture is, do we scale the texture up to be the same size? Do we only have it once? Do we repeat it? So for example, if we have the sprite of a background and we have a tile, like a brick, do we want to repeat that texture as a brick pattern, et cetera? So what we can do is we can construct a sprite, set the texture of the sprite, and then draw the sprite. And so that's the, that's the basic pipeline for OpenGL. Um, if we don't want to draw the entire texture, we can do something like this. OK. Um, we can also set the colors of things. So SFML will let you set the color of a texture. And you're like, well, the texture has color information. So what does that mean? Well, if we have an original image like this, and we change it, the sprite, to green, it'll essentially put a layer of green on top of that thing. So if we just had one sprite, now in our game, we can make it any color that we want without having to have an individual texture of all those colors. But once we get to shaders later, later, later in the course, we'll show you how to do that with shaders. And it's, it's way better than doing it this way. Um, sometimes you'll see a white square or a black square where you expect a texture to be. It just means that that texture wasn't supported, or you specified the wrong type of texture or something like that. Um, we don't want to use OpenGL code. So we'll skip on that. Um, yeah, so that's as much of this that I'll do, but that's the important stuff. The drawing of textures and sprites, the window, et cetera. The last thing I want to do, which I don't have a ton of time, 
Let me just see how big this is on the screen. Okay, it's not that big at all. That kind of sucks. Okay, so while you're doing your assignment, you may want to say, uh, how do I make a drop-down box in, in IM GUI? How do I make like a selectable thing from a list? How do I make a checkbox? How do I make a table? How do I make whatever? If you Google it, you get a surprisingly, shockingly little amount of information. And the reason for that is because all of that information is contained within the I am GUI demo. So if we go down here, anywhere in our program, and we say, I am GUI show demo window, and we recompile, this shows, as it says, the I am GUI demo window. That demo window, unfortunately for the people here live today, what's going on? Do I have an error? Oh, don't do it to me. Okay, there we go. All right. Why would this? I swear to God, this works. Oh, maybe I did it before. Yes, OK. I did it before the update instead of after the update. Please work. Thank God. All right. So we can minimize these individual windows. This is the IM GUI demo window. And without getting too much into it, all of this like, hey, I want to see what all the different types of windows are. Um, here's images that I can have. Here's text that I can have. Bullet lists. Trees of stuff. Oh, look, I can go into these trees. Um, I can do layout and scrolling. Um, here's a child window inside of our window. right? So I have something right here and then something over here. And so this demo window shows you every possible feature of I am GUI. How do you get the code of that? Well, if you come back to Visual Studio and you go over to I am GUI demo.cpp, that is where all the code of that is. And so it has like a little tutorial built into the CPP file. And then so if I want to say, um, what do I want, a combo box? Oops, a combo. So that's, I just search for it. I am GUI combo. OK, that's how I do it here. If I want a, a tab for my program, well, I would search for it this way. It's kind of annoying, but all the demo is there. It's very well commented. And so you can do I am GUI show demo window, spend as much time as you want going around that demo window. Then, once you find the feature that you want, you look in the code, and it has the sample code for you. That, that's pretty much it. Now, I mean, you can Google it if you want as well. I'm sure you'll find help, file, help on it. But this is the weird way that IMGUI sort of has its tutorial and code built into um, the system. Uh, I kind of want to do a little bit more I am GUI programming, but I think you're good for assignment one. So what I'll do is when I explain assignment two, I'll have a little bit more of that. Were there any questions about anything uh, we've done so far? Uh, SFML, I am GUI, the assignment. Yep. Is there a documentation for I am GUI? It's not great. Um, the GitHub for it exists. It has this file in the GitHub, but there's not like I, I don't think there's like a true API for it. If I find one, I'll let you know, but I haven't found one yet. So let me just like, you know, let's go over here. I am GUI API documentation. Let's see what it gives me. API docs? <laughs> it's an issue. <laughs> right? Okay. Wait, wait, wait. We've got something here. Um, dear I am GUI, okay. See, where's the docs? OK. We've got some tutorial stuff going here. It's cool. Oh, it has like graphs and stuff in it. It's cool. Like you can show the FPS of your game over time, like all sorts of neat stuff. Color picker. Um, 
various tools, it says. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's, uh, has it, does anyone know this game or has played this game? It's called Wonder Boy 3. So that game was a game for the Sega Master System, which was Sega before the Genesis, so the NES version of the Sega. It was actually my favorite game as a kid. It's very, very good. I recommend playing it. Um, but they released it. Uh, a company got permission to rewrite the game um, like, and have fancier graphics and music and stuff. And as you're playing through the game in the new fancier version, you can hit a button to switch back to the old and new graphics like as you're playing. It's pretty neat. But I, I actually didn't notice this, that this must have been one of the ways that they were developing the game is, is with I Am GUI. So that's cool. Um, so lots of different stuff you can do. Let's see what they're doing here. Different layers of drawing, editing tools, um, a profiler. Oh, wow. That's cool. So the profiler built right into the, the UI of the game. Audio. So maybe here's all the different uh, audio files you can have. So I Am GUI is, is literally used to write game engines like this. It is a very, very powerful um, user interface. Once you get into it, you can do graphing. There's like docking, so you can click and drag it, and it'll dock to the side, and you can have sub-windows and stuff. I don't think we're going to necessarily get that far into it, but it's, it's very powerful. So yeah, there, are, there is some documentation, but there's not like a list of all the UI elements, which is kind of, hey, if you want to contribute to their project, maybe you could say, let me write a tutorial, or let me write an API, or something like that, and then they'd upload it. I don't know. Maybe they would. Any other questions? Yep. Um, for the, the, the draw window where you can give it the option for uh, Fortnet to draw, does it draw from the top left of the window out? Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, uh, if you want to draw a window Which, on a screen, yep. you can give it uh, the, co the coordinates of the screen. Yes, and that again is from the top left. That's top left. Yeah. And so you can also pass in, like, if you have multiple monitors, then, like, so when I have a home, I have three monitors. And if I want to place something on my left monitor, it's actually a negative x value. Yeah. And so like, you can draw it wherever you want. It's, it's, yeah. So typically, if you don't do that, then um, it'll just draw in the last place that it was like, dragged to by the user. So it might actually be annoying for the user if they like, had it in a specific spot last time, and then they close it, and now you're opening it in whatever spot that you set it again. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Great. OK. Oh, yeah. Um, what if you want to draw a texture and make sure like, none of it's cut off because it's just character and you don't want it to, to be missing an arm or something? So if you just load a texture by default and draw it, then it's, the whole thing is drawn. Oh, OK. Yeah. You can, as an optional thing, specify a sub portion of that texture to be drawn. Oh, okay. But we'll be, I have like. In assignment three, before assignment three, we have a whole lecture on that. Okay. So you'd yeah. probably do something like that uh, for like a character, and then for like the color of a wall, you just fit it to the shape of the wall and make sure it's drawn. Yeah, so the shape and size of the sprite that's being drawn is not necessarily the size of the texture. Because like, and we'll get into this again, but let's say I want to have textures of a character like me, right? I might just be standing like this. So you'd say, OK, the image size of that texture stops about here, stops about here. But then there's another frame of animation where I want to be doing this. right? Typically, you want to have all of your images for textures of a given thing to be the same size for lots of different reasons. right? And so what you would do is calculate the maximum size of any pose and then that is the size of your texture. And then all the pixels that are not you are transparent pixels. So when you draw it, you're just drawing this, but it's like it's just trans